I want to talk to you today about a subject that is timely. But even as I speak about that subject, one of the things that I want to do, I want to decode deception. Because what the enemy has done, the enemy has focused so much on deception. That we don't even know the seasons and the times. And we focus on the timelines of the enemy. Meanwhile, the enemy is doing what he needs to do within his own timeline. So that he can disrupt the timeline of God. And is the reason why one of the greatest calls in the Bible is you must not cease to pray. The Bible says that men always ought to pray and not faint. Because fainting, that means you have become a victim of the philosophy of the enemy. Your lifestyle has then become the lifestyle that is conscripted by the enemy. And your civilization is managed by demons. And so it's utterly vital that for you to walk in the truth you must be adopted by the spirit of the truth. If you don't know the Holy Spirit and if you haven't walked with the Holy Spirit, you'll be walking in darkness and your end will come before you know Jesus on this earth. And even as a Christian, you can give your life to Christ and you can be born again and you can still be deceived. Some Christians, are they get born again and they don't think there's anything useful they ought to do on this earth. So then you ask, why is your salvation? Why is God sustaining your life on this earth? Why did he create you and get you to be born through a woman and put you on this earth, in this nation, in Kiambu, in Dindigua, or you were born in Keremari Embu, like where I come from? Surely, there has to be the intelligent design and counsel of God that has caused all this to come into process. And therefore, one of the things that we need to know is we need to know the Holy Spirit. And we need to walk in the light of Jesus Christ. Having the advantage of working with governments and speaking to presidents and all that, you, you, you see that nations begin well, then somewhere on the way, deception hits so hard. Or the altars of the enemy start waxing strong and their sacrifices become stronger and stronger. And then a nation becomes derailed and the philosophy of that nation becomes the philosophy of lies. And the people in that nation live a life for long and they become slaves and donkeys of a nefarious system. That is not godly. I've had the privilege to sit in boardrooms that decide the future of this country. And it's a wrestling match between the truth and lies. Truth and lies. And when you say leaders that have started making a mistake, it means they do not walk in the counsel of God. In some of those decisions that look like foolish decisions, they don't have the wisdom of God. They tend to be the ones that govern the nation. And therefore, true revival is when societies and nations repent and start to walk in the truth of the one that is truth. When you know really who you are, and when you start to know him, then you start to know what you ought to do on this earth and the way you need to walk. It 
You know, one of the most profound stories in the Bible that was speaking about what Christ was coming to do and where the earth was. And even looking at nations of the earth right now. The Lord this morning reminded me of Hosea. This was a consecrated prophet of God. Walking in holiness. But God wanted his prophet to feel the frustrations and the pain of God. And so what God did an extraordinary thing. And the Lord had Hosea marry a prostitute named Gomer. He took her as his wife. But Goma kept wandering into the arms of other lovers. She was unfaithful. And yet the Lord told Hosea to keep going after her again and again. And bring her back home. Prophet Hosea was commanded to marry an unfaithful wife. And they set up a model for Israel's broken relationship with God. Israel had been chosen and loved by God. Yet had been unfaithful to him by way of adultery. Just as Hosea redeemed his strangled wife and sought to continue his relationship with her. God promised to redeem Israel and renew their relationship with him. The story of Hosea and Goma is an unforgettable picture of God's strong and ending love for his covenant people. You can read this story from Hosea, Hosea 1, 1 to 11. And that is a true picture of who we really are. Of what our nations have become. Harlots. And the king looks at us as harlots who cannot be satisfied by his love and his arms. The love of God doesn't seem to be adequate for God's chosen people. And Hosea was commanded that even your children will be the result of harlotism. Your children are not going to be old. The redemption plan was for a plan of God's bride who was never primarily and earlier satisfied by the love of his husband. And she kept on enjoying the warmth and the love of strangers and violating the very love of the king. And the king never got tired of going and buying her back. The prophet of God, of God was told, I will make you feel what I feel. And I will show you the reality of what nations have become in my eyes. And therefore, our redemption was a redemption of a harlot back to the husband. Of which the offsprings were not even from the king. It means that the civilization of what came from Goma was so torn apart. That God was not only redeeming her. God was also redeeming that which came from her. That's the reason why the demand of the king is present your bodies as a living sacrifice. He says this can only be the reasonable sacrifice. And I keep on saying, a sacrifice can be given to a wife. Dowry, name it, everything. Whatever it is that you want. Big time, everything. Look at this. Major, big. How many cows do you want? Take them. How many goats do you want? Take them. But you cannot buy love. And God knows that he can buy our love. We can only see the sacrifice on the cross and we become reasonable to accept that sacrifice. Surely, he died for us. Hosea lived this. 
And Hosea lived a shameful life. Like Jesus lived a shameful life. He was restoring a harlot. Have you tried to love someone who can't love you? Have you tried to provide for someone whose your provision is not adequate for them? Have you tried to sacrifice your entire life? You have high blood pressure. You have everything. You have taken up all their diseases and all their troubles. All their brokenness is breaking you apart. Is bringing you shame. But they have not seen that as anything useful. And they come back and it becomes a revolving door syndrome. Where they come in and come out as they wish. And the king never got tired of restoring back his people. says, it doesn't matter where you go, I will come back for you. And the sacrifice of Jesus is that powerful restoration of a lover who has never found him enough. Of a powerful lover who has never wanted to discover his full warmth. Who has never desired his intimacy. And who, even initially, As I said, the story of Hosea and Goma, unforgettable picture of God's strong and ending love for his covenant people. And that is what we are going to talk throughout the season. Throughout this season. That God figured out nothing else is going to fix this Unless I do it myself. And I'm going for her. I'm going for her. I'm leaving my throne. I'm leaving my righteousness. The, the place of my comfort. And I'm going for this. I'm going for my lover who I created for my own pleasure. But has been pleasing other lovers. I'm going for this lover who has never discovered or my love has never been enough for them. Even when I show them and I reveal to them my might, they will still fall in love with a stranger, another God. They will still fall for the ordinances of the other. They will still depart from me. It's never going to be enough. But I'm going to leave my holies of holies. And I'm going to go and show them that this time round, they will take my entire life and I will take the entire shame so that there can be an exchange. I'm going to raise an altar so that nothing ever wins them back again. And he says, look at this as this reasonable. Look at this as reasonable. Look at this as reasonable. Is it reasonable enough that God in his own measure, in his own self, came to earth and died for you? Is it reasonable enough that he lived like a man to show you how men ought to live? Is it reasonable enough that he took in your entire shame for his glory and exchanged his life with yours on the cross? Have you ever seen God be challenged by men? He was challenged by men. He was insulted by men, mortals, looking at the immortal and saying, you're nothing to us. Who are you? Will you consider this sacrifice as useful? The other thing that I wanted to do, I just wanted to paint a picture of the broken heart of God and his desire to consistently go for us. Doesn't matter how far you fall from this Messiah. What he has given to you to restore you, to show you that he's serious with loving you, can never be measured by anything else on this earth. There is nothing that will ever measure that sacrifice that he put up on the cross 
the demonstration of the utmost love of a lover who means business for the love of his life. One of the things that I love watching is that I love watching the, the movies of Christ. And, and I love picturing exactly what happened on that particular day. We are moving into the Passover season because Passover hasn't come yet. It's going to be in April, I think 20, 22nd to the 24th there. And I want to talk about it. We have been taught the ordinances of halotism. Because Satan, the great halot, has established a system that looks like it, but is not it. But we're not interested in pursuing the truth and knowing exactly what's the truth. I don't tell me that God will just put you on earth without a calendar, without seasons, without a clear path, without a clear plan. Is it possible for us to establish an inquiry on every knowledge that comes to you and test the spirit behind that knowledge? One of those truths that we need to disestablish today or to establish today is that Passover and Easter are not the same. Passover is biblical. Easter is the worship. Or is a feast that celebrates a pagan holiday that has everything to do with the rebirth of a nefarious spirit that is called Ishtar. The Passover is going to happen in April. The dates of Vista keep on changing. If you're keen, you'll know. They keep on changing. So, so, you know, next year is different. This year is different. The other year is going to be different. But the enemy is doing exactly what the enemy has prescribed that should happen for Easter. And Easter is a festival that dates all the way. It's actually a spring festival because it's spring now. That dates back long before Christ. It praised the pagan goddess of facility and spring known as Ostara or Easter or Oestra. The Bible tells us clearly that Jesus was crucified during Passover, just before Passover. So what you need to follow clearly is Passover. One of the most cherished holidays in the Jewish calendar. Because we have several calendars. We have the Gregorian, we have the Julian then we have the Jewish civil calendar, and then we have what it is that we call the biblical calendar, which was given to Moses. In the book of Leviticus, you'll be able to see it clearly in terms of which holiday happens when and when God prescribed them. True to the word of the enemy, as you may well know, that yesterday Joe Biden announced a national holiday to celebrate transgenderism. And that's the reason why we must pray for the U.S. Yesterday, Joe Biden, the fallen president of the United States, declared that it's going to be the national day for celebrating transgenderism. Now, you may take that lightly, but this is in honor of that goddess. And this sits as a potent evangelism scheme to completely obliterate the family and to introduce confusion on the earth. Because God made us in his own image. 
with a binary anatomical body that is either male or female. He created us. We know that even when you read in the book of Judges, demons are fluid. They are gender fluid. So in today's world, you can choose to remain how God created you or become how demons want to remake you. The truth of the fact today is that your genitalia and sexual identity is a target of serious spiritual warfare. The demons, Baal and Asherah, which are mentioned largely in the Bible in the book of Judges, want to be worshipped. And they want to introduce non-binary and confusion at the lowest level. There's a heavy move of demonic evangelism to the young, as, as young as possible, to cause confusion, trauma, and devastation. And that's why we must rise in defense and make sure that we build safety nets for our families. These are no longer the days that you introduce certain freedoms. As you know, you can watch Cartoon Network as much as possible. You're aware that SpongeBob is gay. It's gender fluid. It's not the days that you can take for granted tools of entertainment that were safe. Today, they're not. And the enemy is attacking these kids and our generations right from the womb. In Ephesians 6.12, the Bible tells us something important. It defines the order of the army of hell. And it says, for we do not wrestle. It already tells you whether you're a nice guy, whether you're beautiful, whether you're handsome. doesn't matter what your language is. There's a wrestling match that has been introduced to you. And it says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Now, it starts with the least order and then finishes up with the highest order. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Principalities. These are demonic orderlies that govern ter territories. For example, you know about a municipality. A prince and a polity is then a demonic entity. It's not a king. It's operating on behalf of a higher authority that has been apportioned territories to make sure that they advance a demonic philosophy. So the places that you live in if there are more clubs more than anything else. If you find that the civilization of the place that you live in does not mirror as it is in heaven, it means that the principality upon that area, because demons have names. We have the spirit of uncleanliness. We have the spirit of this. It means that the spirit in that area, the principality of that area, is exactly advances this specific thing. So you can pray with knowledge. And then the second power, it says, against powers. What powers these principalities? Against rulers. Now, when you look at the Jewish Bible, you find that these rulers are actually governmental rulers. The Jewish translation says against governmental rulers of the darkness of this world. And the highest of them against spiritual wickedness in high places. I keep on telling you that politics is not politics. And I reference you to Nebuchadnezzar, the king who operated all the nine occults. If you were the best warlock in those days, you would have found a job and an office in Nebuchadnezzar's government. And when Nebuchadnezzar 
was coming to take over your nation, they will first cast a spell on your nation and your nation will fall and it will start to cultivate a culture that does not represent God and your nation will fall. That is today what we call secularism. And then when the soldiers of Nebuchadnezzar, the army, the great army of Nebuchadnezzar, when they show up, they're only coming to take over that which darkness has torn apart. When you look at the texture of many nations today, you will know that the majority of these philosophies from hell are coming through governments. In this country, we have fought. The other day, the Supreme Court legalized homosexuality in this country. You must not take for granted the one who you vote in. Because the one who you vote in is a marionette of a spirit. Either the Holy Spirit or the spirit of darkness. Do you know why Haiti is so fallen today? Because the first man to govern that nation announced that the national religion for that country was voodoo. He says, we don't want Christianity in this country. And voodoo became the national religion for Haiti. And when his son came in, I think his son was called something baby or something. The advancement of voodoo was so strong. Darkness hit that country. That country became a shell of its former self. Earthquakes. Natural occurrences that were not normal. Devastating death. Today, one of the most fallen nations in that part of America is Haiti. And that's the reason why I keep on asking the church in this country. If you say that revival will come out of this nation, then you must be brave enough to take on the demons in those countries and take them down and ensure that we give Haiti back to God. Why should we entertain the devil to rule any country on this earth when revival is streaming from this country? The men of God in those countries, in that country, they reached out to me and they said, you guys must come. You must come to this country and establish back a godly civilian rule. We must not only be interested in the territory called Kenya. If the devil is advancing his philosophy from the U.S. and it comes back here, why should we sit pretty? And that's the reason why I keep on telling this church, adopt a county. Adopt a county. Take on that county. Take a trip there. Go to a hotel. It doesn't have to be expensive. Fast and pray there for seven days and come back. Take Mandera. Take Garissa. Take nations. Pray for these nations. There's a reason why God says, ask me of the nations. Because he knows that the altars that are going to be planted in those nations by the enemy, they will be fresh and they will work strong. And the philosophy of hell will be very strong in those countries. Seven hundred years before Christ was hung on the cross. Isaiah 53 5 was spoken. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own ways. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Your redemption, the redemption of every nation was prophesied many years before Christ died on the cross. He simply came to actualize it. Simply came up to set an altar that no other demonic cult on earth will be able to contend and contest against it. 
what we ought to do is to live this as a potent reality today. The Bible says that all this, it has been finished. We are not supposed to live as defeated people. We are supposed to contend and wrestle with all that lineup that I have read to you. For clarity, again, the holy day of Pesach or Passover falls on the Hebrew calendar dates of Nisan 15 and 22. And therefore, Passover 2024 begins before sundown on Monday, April 22nd to 24 and ends after nightfall on April 30th, 2024. All the four Gospels state that Jesus was crucified on the day of preparation. You can read it in Matthew. In Matthew, you can read this in Matthew 27, 62, Mark 15, 42, Luke 23, 54, John 19, 14, 31, and 42. Mark, Luke, and John all state that the following day was the Sabbath. John's account uses this wording. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. So therefore, Thursday, Passover proper. The lamb is killed and Jesus and his disciples eat the Passover meal in the upper room. Friday, the day of preparation. Jesus is tried and executed, although never convicted. The Jews continue their Passover celebrations with the Chiga, Chagi, Chagiga offerings made during the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. Saturday, there was the Sabbath, which is the weekly Sabbath. And Sunday was also noted as the Resurrection Day. Why is Passover important to us? Is the reason why we need to ask even as we prepare through that season. Passover is the second most important holy day for the Jewish, of the Jewish calendar. Jewish families gather for a standard ritual meal called the Seder. During which specific elements recount the history of Israel and retell the story of God's dramatic deliverance of their ancestors. Here is a bit of a chronology. God delivered the Jewish people from 400 years of slavery, number one. The reason why Passover is important. Number one, God delivered the Jewish people from 400, of, 400 years of slavery. 400 years before the Passover, God saved the Jewish people from a deadly famine by bringing them to Egypt. And that's the reason why I say Africa is critical. Whenever God wanted to save, to preserve Israel, brought it into Africa. Whenever he wanted to save Israel, got Israel out of Africa. The only nation prepared with storehouses of food. By God's sovereignty, Joseph, one of the Israel's 12 sons, who was sold as a slave by his brothers, had risen to second in command over Egypt. When the Israelites faced the vision, Pharaoh welcomed them into the land because of Joseph. But after Pharaoh died, his successor put the Jewish people to work as slaves. They lived in bondage until God called Moses as his instrument to deliver them. 400 years later. Those are four generations. Today, the Passover, if God had not delivered us, the Passover Haggadah reads, we would still be slaves. Tell the person next to you, if God has not delivered us, we will still be slaves. Please look at them and tell them. Look at them and tell them. Are you telling them? What are they saying? It therefore means that slavery is a personal choice forthwith. Slavery is a personal choice. 
The second thing why Passover is important to us is that God showed his power through the miracles surrounding Passover. Pharaoh recalled at the idea of letting the Hebrew slaves leave Egypt. If they departed, he would lose a million laborers. He refused to let them go and in doing so, opened the door for God to reveal his power to all of Egypt. After each of Pharaoh's obstinate denials, God brought a supernatural plague upon the nation of Egypt. From locusts, to frogs, to boils, to water turning, to blood, God displayed his power throughout the land. And all who, all who endured the plagues recognized that the God of Israel was mighty and determined to liberate his people. Today I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, that God will never give up on your deliverance and liberation. That is not the God that we serve. And whatever that seeks to plague you, God is constantly working to ensure that not only will your enemy see his power, but your deliverance is assured. It is only a matter of time. The miracles continued after their departure. The Israelites too observed the God of their fathers intervene for their rescue. Pharaoh enemies pursued. The Israelites walked on dry ground right through the middle of the Red Sea as the waters created a high wall on either side. There's the evidence of that, by the way. The pillar of fire was so strong. When you visit that place, it literally melted the stones and you will see the imprints of the footsteps as they walked by to their liberation. Through the Passover and Exodus, the God of Israel was manifested and glorified for all to see. God demonstrated his power and his glorious magnitude over that deliverance. The third one is that God reaffirmed his covenant with Abraham and further sent apart the Jewish people, set apart the Jewish people as his chosen people. For generations, slavery was all the Jewish people knew. I don't know how to say this, but there are people who the only thing they know is poverty. There are people who have never enjoyed the love of a father or the love of a mother. There are people who by birth were orphaned. There are people who their imprints in the journey in their family, they have never experienced joy. And for 400 years, the Israelites knew nothing else but pain and slavery. And so you can imagine. Four generations. 100 years later. That liberation was a dream that had come true. And that's the reason why... The Sabbath day stands to dignify man without any objects of slavery whatsoever. No work, no labor, nothing. Just you and your God. And the Passover is a strong reminder of the God that liberates his people. But many forms, every form of slavery. They were born into bondage and some of them died into bondage. Say this day, I refuse to die in bondage in the name of Jesus. Because when God steps in, the picture changes. God stepped in to extricate them as a people. He conveyed to them that he had not forgotten them. God will not forget you in the name of Jesus. 
The God of Israel is faithful to keep his covenant with, his, with their father, Abraham. He will not forsake his promise. God's intervention to free the children of Israel told them that they were still his people. Because for 400 years they had felt forsaken. Their fathers and their mothers and their brothers and their sisters and their children were being raised and in, in, in slavery and they died in slavery. I don't know whether you know it, but when Hitler was doing what he did, the Israelites were living in ghettos. Never had toilets. They never knew bathrooms. They never knew good shoes. They never knew what it means to brush their teeth or to have a good meal. They just didn't know what it feels to be liberated. But today when you visit the nation of Israel, that the enemy wants to conquer again and send them into slavery, you will see an advanced people living in freedom and in advanced civilization. It's almost imaginable that this was hardly 77 years ago. The God of Israel is faithful to keep his covenant with their father Abraham. He will not forsake his promise. God's intervention to free the children of Israel told them that they were still his people. And he was still their God. He raised them up from a subjugated people and reminded them that they were a called and a chosen people. Fourth reason why Passover is important to us is that God called the Jewish people out to give them a land of their own. God will never liberate a people and fail to give them the abundance of his resources. We don't move from one deliverance to another. No, no, no. That's not what the Bible says. We don't seek deliverance every day. The Bible tells us we move from one glory to the next glory. They move from liberation, from poverty, from slavery, from destitution, from hard labor to ownership in Jesus' name. And I prophesy today that everyone under the sound of my voice you will move from any kind of poverty or any kind of slavery or from any kind of heartbreak to prosperity in the name of Jesus. You will be owners. You will be landlords. You will hold your children in prosperity. You will cultivate your own land. You will have that which is yours without anybody telling you, don't do this and don't do that. You will be graced. You will be respected. You will be a people who are lifted up high. And nobody will ever look down upon you again. You will love again. You will love again. You will be satisfied again. God is going to restore you again. Never anymore shall you be a laborer to anyone. God has promised us that he's moving us from one glory to another glory. And we accept that reality in the name of Jesus. We denounce slavery of any kind. You will own your company. You will have products that are labeled after you. You will run your own vehicles. You will have your own transport system. You will be a landlord and a landlady. You, I'm telling you the truth. I am not saying this as a motivation speaker. I'm saying this as a prophet of God. And I see that reality coming upon you in the name of Jesus. This is a reality of the Passover. This is a reality that we can live in the plenty of God. For how long shall we be slaves? 
is what the first generation asked themselves. A hundred years lapsed. The second generation said, Lord, where are you? A hundred years hit them until 400 years were over. And God said, I'm done with this. Enough of this. I'm changing your circumstances. I'm coming to liberate you. And I know what God said to me many weeks ago. He said, this Sunday, I'm going to do something special for my people. And I confirmed it in the night. The master visited me. So if you think I'm just talking, continue thinking. But you will see others living that reality that I'm speaking to now. There will be an evidence that the master spoke to his servant. I have seen God take me from the dust. And I have seen when I was at the dust is when you will know the true picture of people. It's when you'll know it is better to be at the mercy of God than being at the mercy of people. They will look down upon you. It doesn't matter who you are or who you are. But the generosity of God can never be matched by anyone. This is a God who came and demonstrated his power to save. The potency of the salvation that we see in Egypt. <coughs> in case you think Egypt is a small country. I don't know whether there are historians here but a short study of Egypt will tell you that the civilization in Egypt has never ever been seen anywhere else in the world. Today we are still struggling to who build the pyramids. Everything that has been written down against you in judgment the blood of Jesus. Jesus, God has annulled that in Jesus' name. And God wants you to go and exercise this liberty. Be very careful. The Israelites were saved from Egypt, but their hearts were never saved. They continued to be the hallow. They never gave their heart to the Savior. They continued in harlotry, in their own fallen ways, even when God demonstrated his power. It was not the devil, it was a mentality. It wasn't the devil. God dealt with the enemy. The reason why the Red Sea parted, the reason why he parted the sea, was to deal with the altar of Pharaoh. He was vanquished. He had dealt with the enemy. But the mindsets of these people were still mindsets of a harlot. A lover who is not satisfied with the love of his life. And I'm telling you the problem today on this earth is not Satan. He was conquered on the cross. He was conquered. He was conquered. And, and, and that act is never going to happen again. Minds are still backwards. Minds are still backwards. The worst stronghold of humanity is their minds. 400 years in slavery that had stuck. Many of you don't think you can be landlords. You don't think you can be billionaires. You don't think you can build hotels like this and give them to God. You don't think you can feed nations because it's a reality that you can't think and God says think these things. Think them. I have liberated you. I'm giving you your land so that you free time to worship me and relate with me. I don't want anything else to preoccupy you. God called the Jewish people to give out to give them a land of their own. The Israelites didn't know where they were going but they knew their God had set them free and promised to give them a good and a large land in which to dwell as a nation. You see it in Exodus 3, 8. 
most amazing thing is that never again, never again, never again, never again would any Jew suffer. You can tell them nothing. They've been bombed many years. Any Israelite who was born 70 years ago has never lasted a week without seeing rockets fired into their land. Because the enemy is still pursuing the tenets of slavery. It takes a loving and a faithful God to address your slavery. Degrees are good. Philosophy is also good. But we're talking about one kingdom against another. The witchcraft in your family. The altars in your family. Today, as I stand here, the Holy One is addressing them. Believe it. That when you go back home, you don't, you don't need to live in a certain way, a certain fallen way. You don't need to beg for bread. knew that they would live in the land given to them directly by God. There's one thing when a man gives you something because you're subject to them. There's another thing when God gives you a thing. Because when God gives you a thing, Pastor Samuel, it's what we say, no gates of heads can stand against it. Every shaking that will come, it will never be destroyed. But anything that you receive from a man, then that you will have to be the slave to that person. And that's the reason why we preach against debt. The Bible says that we should lend to nations. It means your wealth is greater than a nation. By the way, you're supposed to be richer than Kenya. Kenya is not supposed, when they are reading the budget, you are supposed to be saying, these guys, can we, can we be serious? Increase it with a few trillions. So borrowing from the IMF. Excuse me, your excellency. I'll come and see you in the afternoon. It's sorted. Israel was on her way to becoming a nation with a homeland of her own. You're on your way to becoming a great nation with what is yours. Not what is borrowed. What is yours. You will feel and experience the liberty Of not being a slave to anyone. And I believe that is going to be a potent reality to which we live by today. Israel was on her way to becoming a nation with a homeland of their own. Today, every nation on earth is preoccupied with Israel. Every nation on earth, the UN passes more resolutions against Israel than anybody else. The EU, every country is preoccupied with it. And guess what? The Bible. 40 Jews who wrote this within a season and a period of 1600 years synced the inspiration, no error is a proof that there is an intelligent God behind our living today. 90% of the Bible prophecies about the land of Israel have come. They are realized today. The mountain of the Lord 
which he calls Zion, where the temple will be built. Today, five nations own it. They contend against it. They will live in the land given to them directly by God. The impact of that land, of that land grant, because it was a grant, it was not a loan. Reverbage through the centuries, standing strong and true despite various exiles over the years or dissenting opinions today. Passover opened the door to receiving the promised land. And I, I, in the name of Jesus, prophesy that you will receive your promise today if you believe it in the name of Jesus. Passover opened that door. Shkanosa be eskara to receive that promise. Everyone who has attacked Israel over the centuries, they don't exist today. They don't exist. But the land stands strong as an anchor to what God gives you. No one can take it. No one can destroy it. No one can do anything about it. What God will give you. No demon on earth. No angels in heaven can take it away. The fifth thing why Passover is important is that God established a watershed for the Jewish people and an inheritance of faith to pass on. Passover is known as a watershed event in Jewish history. It was a turning point, a defining moment for the Jewish people. I don't know if you have lived in problems. I don't know if you have been struck by a difficult disease. I don't know if you have hit rock bottom of poverty. But when that turning point came, that watershed moment that defines you forever. I'm not talking about receiving a history of 300, a salary of 300,000 every month. I'm talking about a watershed moment that will completely turn your fortunes around. Israel was never going to be slaves again. And I perceive in the spirit that God is going to give people here their watershed moment. Your turning point is coming in the name of Jesus. I know it's coming. I know it's coming. I know your turning point is coming in the name of Jesus. I know God is providing your deliverance so that you can walk from one glory to another. I know your cry, that you cry every night alone, will be joy every night alone. I know that your shame will cease. I know that you will never know lack or disease. I know that you will not die young. And I know that favor will never leave your house in the name of Jesus. I know that because this is a God who has proven this time and time and time again. I'm not talking about your rich uncle who can change from time to time. I'm not talking about a spouse who is driven by emotions every morning. I'm talking about a God who even though his lover is a harlot, he's not insecure about it. He says, I will just sacrifice more. I will plague the enemy more. I will bomb that base until they release my lover. I'm not going to give up on you. I will not sleep or slumber. I, your God, I will not know rest 
until I save you for life. Everything changed for them with the Passover. God rescued, preserved, and called them out to be his people in their own land. And immediately after their departure from Egypt, he instituted the feast of Passover as an everlasting memorial to the astounding feat of the deliverance. God set an annual appointment for Israel to intentionally remember what he had done for them in the Passover and Exodus. Thousands of years later, Jewish people still commemorate this and tell their children passing on legacy of faith in the one true God just as he commanded them. Sixth thing is that God revealed a prophetic glimpse of the promised Messiah's sacrificial death. By God's sovereign design, the feast of Israel established in Leviticus 23 contained a prophetic shadow of God's redemptive plan for mankind. And within Passover is the picture of Messiah's death to deliver us, to deliver us from the bondage of sin. The final plague in Egypt was the death of the firstborn of all households. God revealed to Israel the one way they will be spared. They were to sacrifice an unblemished lamb and brush its blood on the lintel and doorposts of their homes. Only then would the angel of death pass over their homes and spare their firstborn. 1 First Corinthians 5-7 tells us this, that Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Yeshua's shed blood covers our sin and his sacrificial death on our behalf when received in faith delivers us from the bondage of sin. And even as a family of faith and the Jewish families come together at Passover, they remember and teach their next generation about the event that God delivered them as God's people. They also celebrate eternal deliverance provided by Messiah, Yeshua. Therefore, briefly and intently focus as we see Yeshua as our Passover. The first thing is that A key event in the New Testament is a sacrifice of a human male Passover lamb. Yeshua Messiah, for indeed Messiah, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. You see that in 1 Corinthians 5-7. The second one is that Yeshua was sacrificed on the exact same 14th day of the first month. The preparation day before the first day of the feast of unleavened bread. A holy day. Therefore, because it was a preparation day that the body should not remain on the stake on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. John 19.31 You know that the sacrifice of Christ exactly matched with the sacrifice of that lamb many years back, Passover. That one is that Yeshua's sacrifice delivered mankind from the bondage of sin and death as seen in Romans 8-2. Fourth one is that Yeshua was without sin an unblemished sacrifice. And that is 1 Peter 2-22 and 1 John 3-5. Number five was that none of his bones were broken. But when they came to Yeshua and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. That is John 19, 33. And the sixth one is that Yeshua spared all repentant sinners from eternal death. The consequence of our sins 
we have been washed in his own blood as Revelation 1 5. Compare this to how the Israelites were saved from the death of their firstborns. The first seventh one is that Yeshua's disciples continued to keep the Passover annually to remember his sacrifice and still do even to this day. Along with the feast of unleavened bread. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with all living, nor with the living of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. According to 1 Corinthians 5.8, which was penned 20 plus years after Jesus ascended. The scripture shows that the first Passover festival of the sacrifice of the unblemished lambs back in the ancient Egypt was a brilliantly fashioned shadowy precursor of greater things to come centuries later. The sacrifice of Yeshua, Messiah, of all sins, for all mankind, for all time, according to Colossians 2, 16-17. It's important, therefore, brothers and sisters in the house of faith, that we understand that everything we have is by faith. And you have to accept the resurrection of Jesus Christ by faith. When you came here, you came to a hotel, you know that this hotel is solid, it won't collapse by faith. The chair you're sitting, you know it won't collapse by faith. The shoe you're wearing, you wore it and you knew it wasn't going to tear by faith. The trouser or the dress you're wearing, you have confidence. You have faith in it. Therefore, everything we receive is by faith. The question that I want to ask you today is a question that was asked by our Messiah. And he asked this question. Who do you say that I am? Look at the person next to you and ask them, who do you say that Jesus is? Please ask them, don't whisper. Please stand up, stand up across the sanctuary. Just stand up. Go to 10,000 people and ask them, who do you say that Jesus is? Ask them, who do you say that Jesus is? No, they need to answer you. Don't just ask them and move away like Boko Haram, like, you know. You need, a, you need an answer. They need to answer you because I'm going to be taking some samples. I'm going to be calling some of you and the mic needs to go around. Who do you say that Jesus is? Some of you are afraid to walk around because maybe you don't have the answer. Can the sound team walk with? Please, you can, you can, you can, uh, you can regate back to your seat. Sound, mic. Yay. I'm going to point people randomly because if I ask this, they may not answer. Stand with the mic. I want to send you. We're going to do an analysis. And to be fair, I want to start with the Samuels, the firstborn daughter. Give them the mic. You're saying what the other person told you, who they say Jesus is. So you're giving the answer of the counterpart. You mention their name and say, Praise God. Uh, Christina told me that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Yes. Okay, give to Christina. She tells us what you said. Oh, did you ask her or you asked somebody else? I asked her. Okay. She said that Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is the son of God. Please take those answers. Give it to my sister in the praise and worship team. Who do you say that I am? Amen. By the way, you're telling the other is the answer is who? Who did you ask? I asked him. Who him is who? You don't even know the name. This young man sitting here. 
Yes, Dylan. Dylan. Uh-huh. Yes, he told me that Jesus is the King of Kings uh-huh. and the Lord of Lords. Aduma. Uh-huh. Okay, I'm I'm avoiding. Uh... All right. Uh, choose someone randomly on that the 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 second seat before. Choose choose someone randomly. Where you're standing? Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Is what your friend told you? Eh? Oh, that one. All right, that's fine. Thank you so much, Sam. Who do you say that I am? Some Christians leave. As though Jesus is still dead. They killed him in their faith. They never tell anyone about Jesus. They never speak about Jesus. They never evangelize about him. The whole week they say nothing about their dead Jesus. They killed him in speech. Even at their workplace. Nobody knows whether they are born again. Meanwhile, the Bible says they overcame through the testimony of Christ. Many Christians I know, that's the way they live. How many people this week have you told about Jesus? Sincerely speaking. How many of them Have you told them, do you know Jesus? Can you receive him as the Lord and Savior of your life? If we visit your social media handles, are you interested in posting worldly stuff that's going to give you likes and validation? Because that's what social media has made us so needy that even marriages, Pastor Samuel, are run on social media. So we we are nothing at home you take photos of your broken marriage and you post it on social media, then you get 2,000 likes, then that validation makes you feel married and good. Without social media today, many marriages will not last. Is. My validation is outside there. And I have to keep on checking. Oh no. Only two likes. All is so unfair. I'm not loved by anyone. I'm so depressed. So needy. We have to keep on making content every day. To be validated. We are not content with our lover. We want to trend. Systems of the world. The king of this world. They will name world. They keep on telling it's called cosmos. We are desiring the cosmetic. And denying that which is in the private place. How many of you have desired to be validated by the king of kings in the private place? How many have sent, spent hours in the private place? That's why you saw in the battle the other day the products of TikTok. You may say, this guy is, is against technology. By the way, the technology now is falling. I, I wish, go study the systems of the past. Hey, he, he, I'm, I'm afraid that we are not so mentally developed than it was like before. And God saw it and there was a destruction in the world because the systems of the world were so advanced. They were changing the texture of the earth. Today, historians are still focused on 
who are these intelligent beings? And they can't believe they are humans. They're like, there must be aliens who came. I've seen aliens in the US from Harvard. So who is a man? We can't really tell who is a man. Professor, who is a woman? Can a man get pregnant? Uh, Senator X was said, we can't really tell. It's really fluid. That's an alien. But the question is, who do you say that I am? Because that answer can only be reflected by your lifestyle. You never tell anyone about the resurrected Jesus. Look at the disciples. They spread the gospel everywhere. Violently. Which territory and which civilization have you shaped through the resurrected Jesus? The claims of Jesus of who he was were blasphemous. They were noted and taken as blasphemous. His claims were unbelievable. Were they claims of truth? Was there any evidence? Was Jesus forging himself? Everything he said he was seemed to get him into deeper trouble. And it's evident in today's life because everything that Jesus tells you, it seems you will get him into more trouble. You don't believe that he liberates. You don't believe that he heals. You don't believe he's the Lord and Savior. Our lives tell it all. Because if we don't walk in victory, then which salvation is it that we have taken? What? How can we be adopted into a kingdom that we don't reflect in reality? Then we must think that Jesus is blasphemous. If I tell you of where I come from, Kameo in Embu, are you aware that just before you get to our house, there's a tree. Are you aware that there are flowers outside the gate and the gate is quite big? You know, I'm telling you of a place you've never been. It's Jesus was telling us of a place that we have never been. And the much we can do is accept it by faith. But the human being has the ability and the capacity to live in heaven and live is the only creature that is not original. I keep on telling human beings, the goat is more original than you. Because the goat comes from a goat. The cow, my brother, the cow is more original than you. Because the cow comes from a cow. The fish comes from a fish. But humans come from God. Who do you say Claims of who he was were claimed to be blasphemous in front of the Sanhedrin. He demonstrated it that he was really who said he was. If we want to know who you really are, we will ask your neighbors. If you go and ask the neighbors who have lived with me, has this man ever seen? They'll tell you, Ooh, ooh, ooh that, that Dene. Who don't get you know? It's true. The life that I used to live wasn't so pleasing. But if you ask the neighbors of Jesus, was this man righteous? I'll tell you, he claims he's God. We've never seen him sin, sincerely speaking. It's true. What he says he is, is true. This man, everything he has said, we have seen it. He's not faking it. A shocking revelation. 
is captured in the book of Luke 5, 20, 26. And he says, and when he saw their faith, he said unto him, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus, the only prophet on earth who was able to forgive sins. It's never been seen. That's why they call this a blast. Excuse me? Who are you to forgive sins? We have seen miracle workers who straighten legs and can raise the dead. Even the fake ones did that. There were many fake prophets in the days that Jesus was. But he's the only one who claimed to forgive sin. And today, if you're walking in sin, the same Son of God raised an altar for that omission of sin. They called it a blasphemy. In Matthew 28, 18, he told of another blasphemy. He says, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and the earth. He said, by who? Which power is this you're talking about? All power has been given to you. It, but because we know where you have been born from, we know your father is the carpenter. Is the one who has given you all this power? He was blemish free. Son of God. He said he's the son of God. He told them, before Abraham was, I was. And they asked, excuse me. How many years are you? 33, 32. And you were before Abraham. Pray incarnate. The king with the heavenly kingdom. The first one from the dead who ushered in the kingdom of God. They charged him. Four charges. Sent him on the cross that he loves sinners. Healed on the Sabbath. Preached heresy. And he will sway the people negatively. And that he is king. Jesus was sure about who he was. But the people were not sure about who Jesus was. And if you're not sure about who Jesus is, it doesn't change who Jesus is. It changes who you are. He made the blind to see, the dead to rise, the dumb to talk, the deaf to hear. He had authority over demons and the elements of the earth. I don't know if you've ever seen a storm, but Jesus will break it apart. He had every proof that he was not a common man. And the disciples had received him as the Messiah. Jesus was not a white man, neither was he a black as black as some of us. It's true he was born in the part of the world that touched Africa and Europe. And therefore I dissuade people that Christianity is not a white man's religion. But a religion that the whole world should embrace. I want to remind you that the man who carried his cross was a man from Libya. But today I want to ask you, who do you say that Jesus is? Because it will not change who he is. It will change who you are. Matthew 16, 13, 20 says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, that I the son of man, I am? And they said, Some of us, thou, thou art John the Baptist. These are the disciples. Disciples, I don't know. You can follow somebody and not discern it. A disciple is saying, you are John the Baptist. The guy walked with Jesus. 
but had no revelation. But Jesus did not change their thinking. He, di he didn't say, he, he didn't put up an argument. He didn't say, no, you're stupid. Don't you know that I am this and this? Some Elias and others Jeremiah's or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, but whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, Ekashuta, the son of the living God, Namasuta. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bajona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. I also say to you that your Peter on this rock I will build my church and the gates of it shall not prevail. We sing Jesus. We call him. We pray to him. But when you don't have the revelation of Jesus Christ, you'll be banking on your human abilities. There's a knowing that comes to you by revelation. And this is the rock by which the enemy cannot destroy. That revelation is what is indestructible. You may sink, but you'll be sitting on the rock and you will rise again. When you know by revelation, you know you know. Many know him as a money doubler and a miracle worker. That's the reason why the fake prophets have prospered. If you don't know Jesus through revelation, you will not pray in a certain way. And many chambers of the spirit will not open. And every revelation of Jesus you receive makes a part of your destiny operation. Who do you say that Jesus is? The difference between what has life and what is dead is the knowing, the revelation of Jesus. And today, he has made himself available. I want us to rise on our feet. And the prayer that I want you to pray as you rise on your feet, Jesus, give me a fresh revelation of you. As the praise and worship enjoins me. John in the island of Patmos received the revelation of Jesus Christ as the Alpha and the Omega. I want to tell you this morning that the, the realms of God are becoming available for you to know Jesus again. The place where light dwells is the portals are opening for you to know Jesus again. Paul met Jesus and his apostolic ministries was one of the most important. Philippians 3.10 he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Today I will call on Jesus and he will come. You don't know him by your youth. For the Bible in Isaiah 40, 31 says, Even the youths will faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Jesus stated that he was on a mission to construct a heavenly based entity who shape the civilization of the earth based on a revelation. The entity called the church is eternal. It's eternal and everlasting and only and the only indestructible entity that has an expression on earth. With Jesus on the earth, the worst thing you could do was know him by the flesh. The only way to know him is through the agency of the Father as he is a replica of the Father. Only the Father knew him and only the Father could reveal him as he wills. And today only the Father speaks through him. 
a church founded upon a confession which is based upon the revelation of a person and that foundation is Jesus Christ an enlightenment in the privacy of your heart is what we are looking for and everything you have said or everything you have will be tested and what hasn't come from the father will fall Every revelation is subjected to testing and persecution. The enemy that comes to kill, steal, and destroy will take everything that is not based on a revelation. The gates of hell will come and it will be a brood of fire. That which is not revealed by the Father will be taken away. This is beyond Bible study. It's beyond your mental faculties. It's beyond any connections you can have with any pastor. It will take a personal understanding of the Father and a personal relationship with Jesus to sustain what the Father speaks and to keep anything and everything and only that which comes from Him survive. The soldiers who was guarding the tomb didn't know that something had let loose Jesus. Yet, they were present. He was completely blinded to them. It was only revealed by the angel to the visiting women because they had a relationship with Jesus. I want to ask, Father, reveal yourself to me. Jesus, reveal yourself to me. I want a revelation of you, Father. It's, it's an honest prayer. You're not praying with your mind. You're not praying with your intellect. It's a cry from deep within you.